Tonight, a new Politico report is out about Hunter Biden, and it is not good. It seems many on the left had hoped the questions and federal investigation would evaporate, but they're not. And there's some there there. We'll talk to the journalist who wrote the article. And from the Bi Bidens to Republicans, can classic conservatives win back the party from Donald Trump? Isn't Trump helping that by suggesting Republicans don't vote unless the 2020 election gets solved? Pulitzer Prize winning columnist George Will joins us. And officers ambushed while trying to serve an arrest warrant. The shootout sending officers running for their lives before turning deadly. The whole thing is caught on police body cam. Dan Abrams Live starts right now. Welcome to this Friday edition of the show. There is a new article out in Politico this week about Hunter Biden, and it does not paint a flattering picture. In it, Ben Schreckinger writes that the case for scrutiny of Hunter Biden's personal affairs only grows stronger when viewed in the full context of the family's story and in light of events that have unfolded since Election Day. For years, Republicans have crowed about a number of ethical issues raised by Hunter's personal business dealings. Meanwhile, Democrats were happy to complain that there was no there there while complaining about the Trump kids being never under the microscope. Now, here's the truth. Few want to tell you his conflicts are real. It's a legitimate story. Even if there is no serious evidence in my mind to back up the most salacious allegations attempting to link President Joe Biden to wrongdoing, or at least ethical lapses by Hunter. Last week, we told you about Hunter's pricey art show, where five replicas from the amateur painter's collection fetched $75,000 each. Replicas. The originals are expected to sell for up to half a million dollars each. Not surprisingly, the decision to charge that kind of money for a debut artist concerned many that the purchasers may have been looking for something else. The situation was only made worse when the White House announced that the identities of the buyers would be kept anonymous to both Hunter and the public, leaving it to the art dealers to sort out the ethical questions and filter out suspicious buyers. No matter how you slice it, it's a pretty bad look for an administration that claims to have the highest ethical standards of any administration in history. And remember, Hunter Biden is still the subject of at least one federal investigation into his finances. He's also connected to another investigation looking into potentially illegal lobbying practices by a consulting firm with ties to Burisma Holdings, the Ukrainian energy company whose board Hunter inexplicably sat on from 2014 until 2019. We now know that at least some of the material that leaked from Hunter's alleged laptop appears to be genuine. That should not come as a surprise to many who followed this story. Now, when Hunter was accused of arranging an April 2015 meeting between his father and a Burisma representative in Washington, the Biden camp responded with a carefully worded statement about the meeting not being reflected on official schedules. And now when the White House gets asked about anything Hunter related, we tend to get answers like this. I know this is your favorite topic. Did you have another question on something else? Otherwise, we're going to move on to some yes, other topics. Hunter's a bit of a walking scandal, from Burisma to his laptop to his recent art show. It seems to be sort of a magnet for controversy. So let's bring back Ben Schreckinger, national political correspondent for Politico, who has just written a long piece about Hunter Biden entitled Hiding the Ball, Hunter Biden Complicates White House Anti-Corruption Bush. He's also the author of The Bidens Inside the First Family's 50-Year Rise to Power. Thanks very much uh, for coming back on the show. We appreciate it. All right, so there's a whole range here of potential Hunter Biden issues, but all issues are not created equal. Um, of these various issues, and everyone's talking right now about the artwork, et cetera, that seems to me long-term not to be top of the list. Of Based on your reporting, what do you think should be the most concerning to the Biden family? Well, thanks for having me back, first of all, Dan. Uh, it is difficult to say. I mean, clearly, uh, the number one most concerning thing at the moment is the criminal tax investigation that, as far as we know, is still ongoing uh, in Delaware. 
Uh, there's also uh, a criminal investigation in Western Pennsylvania that was active as of last year. Uh, and as I reported on Tuesday, according to a, a former official who's familiar with that investigation, uh, one focus of it, it's an investigation of a, of a hospital operator out there, one focus of it is representations that Jim Biden, Joe Biden's younger brother, allegedly made uh, about the value of his last name and connections uh, in connection with AmeriCorps Health, that, that hospital operator. Uh, and as you said, there are a number of other issues outstanding, including whether there was a Joe Biden uh, encounter of any sort with this Burisma representative, uh, why we have this email in which uh, there's apparent discussion of Hunter holding equity uh, in a venture with a Chinese oil executive on behalf of his father, uh, and the paintings, as you mentioned. So there's really a whole smorgasbord yeah. here of things that deserve scrutiny. Well, let me ask you, I mean, first, let's, let's talk about Joe Biden for a minute, because I think it's the most important issue here. I've said before that I don't see any evidence up to this point linking Joe Biden uh, to any wrongdoing. Let's even assume for a moment that Joe Biden met with said barista, uh, sorry, barista. Yeah, it tells you what I'm, what I'm doing too much of these days. Burisma, um, <laughs> uh, um, Burisma guy um, in 2015. Let's say he shook the guy's hand. He says hello for a minute. That doesn't seem to me to be the end of the world. I mean, the notion that somehow Joe Biden shaking the hand of some guy who Hunter got him to say hello to, I promise you Don Jr. got many, many people to shake Donald Trump's hand in the course of four years. That's right. And if there were an encounter, it wouldn't be the Teapot Dome scandal, as you, as you said. Uh, and Joe Biden wouldn't be the only high-ranking official to have met with Vadim Pasarsky, this, this advisor to Burisma. Uh, but it would renew uncomfortable scrutiny uh, of this chapter in particular, Hunter Biden's work for Burisma, uh, the problem that it raises that, that it can potentially undermine an anti-corruption message when, uh, when Hunter Biden is working for a company under suspicion of corruption, when there's uh, you know, no real reason other than his connection to his right. father that that uh, explains why he was, was in that position. So, uh, go on. Yeah, you're one of the only you're one of the only reporters out there who's really digging deep on this. I should say one of the only what I view as sort of credible reporters digging deep. There's some others. Um, but are you getting a lot of pushback from people on the left in particular? Why are you doing this? You're just falling for the right wing trap, et cetera, just because you are reporting on what I view as legitimate stories. You know, I, I've uh, adjusted my notification filter on Twitter, so I'm seeing less of the, uh, of the smash talk from both sides. Uh, the reality is, yes, when, when I was reporting on Donald Trump uh, in some hard-hitting ways doing investigative work, uh, I would get hate mail from people or even, you know, a nasty column in Breitbart or something like that. Uh, and my reporting on, on Joe Biden's relatives and their business dealings has gotten me pushback. Uh, from liberal commentators and and from readers out there, uh, and you know it's unfortunate that that we're in such a polarized environment because certain things yep. uh, like conflicts of interest in government uh, really are not partisan issues at the end of the day. Yep, and you had a quote in your article from a woman named Kathleen Clark, a law professor in government ethics at Washington University in St. Louis who said, even though this administration isn't corrupt on the same level as the previous administration, which seemed to embrace the corruption, the public has reason to be concerned. And it does seem that <clears throat> every time you talk about this issue, it's as if you have to say, yes, yes, I cared about the Ivanka Trump story. Yes, I did. But can we stay focused on the Because, by the way, the opposite happens too, right? You'll be talking about something else and someone will say, what about Hunter Biden? What about Hunter Biden? I mean, it, 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 the, what I appreciate about your reporting about this is it's level-headed. You are not doing this in a partisan way. It doesn't seem like you have an agenda, but you are reporting on a very important issue with regard to Hunter Biden. Now, final quick question, ties to China. Um, how significant in terms of Hunter Biden? Well, we don't know for sure if he's completely divested from, uh, from a venture he was involved in uh, earlier on in the Obama years. Uh, Jen Psaki was asked about this recently and, and was not able to answer uh, whether 
he still had that investment. Uh, with regards to the CEFC venture, this more recent venture where you have this 10 held by H for the big guy, uh, we don't have any indication that that went through. Uh, so it's unclear. Like many things uh, related to this broader theme of Hunter Biden's business dealings, we just don't have all the answers. And, and let's be clear on even on that big guy thing, that was when he was post vice president, right? I mean, you're talking about 2017 at that time anyway. I'm not suggesting and therefore it makes everything OK, but it didn't happen and it happened in 2017. Um, so anyway, look, Correct. I think that the facts, the facts are important here. I think that it's important to continue discussing these issues because you know what? It doesn't matter to me if the name is Biden or Trump, if there is potential criminal activity, if there are potential ethical violations, I'm going to discuss them. And it seems Ben Streckinger is going to research them and study them and report on them. So, Ben, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan, and sticking with the story. Coming up, never Trumpers have never been able to gain any real traction in the Republican Party. Not recently. But is there an opening now? Columnist George Will is up next. Welcome back. Everyone, including us, has been talking about the war within the Democratic Party between the progressives and the more moderate wings. They're often very far apart on critical issues, and I tend to side with the moderates of both parties. But the divide within the Republican Party, I think, is far less analyzed. Maybe that's because it seems the party coalesces around Donald Trump, that there's no significant divide. But I'm not so sure it's a done deal. Yes, the polls support it today, according to uh, Pew Research. Less than a third of Republicans want Trump out as a major figure in the Republican Party. And recent polling by Politico and the Morning Consult show the former president has an 84 percent approval rating among Republicans, but more and more people are leaving the Republican Party and becoming independents. According to the latest polling from Gallup, just 29% of Americans identify as Republicans, another 29% as Democrats, and a whopping 41% say they're independents. And actually, in many of the polls, uh, Democrats show up as higher than Republicans in terms of self-identification. Now, for years, so-called Never Trump Republicans have called on aggrieved conservatives to fight back and even to float blue if necessary, but they've never made a huge dent in Trump's support. But now with the former president calling on Republicans this week to effectively sit out the 2022 and 2024 elections, that's what he said, if we don't solve the presidential election fraud of 2020, Republicans will not be voting in 22 or 24, et cetera. Um, Republicans are going to face an existential question. Question is, do they risk losing power by sticking with Trump? After all, many won't speak out against him because they fear he'll sink their careers. But what if he starts to sink their careers and the party by calling for Republicans not to vote? Is it even possible for old school conservatives, the ones who are more like, let's say, George Will than Donald Trump to win back their party? Or is Trump holding on to the reins? Here to discuss is George Will, Washington Post columnist whose work can be seen in papers across the country and a longtime outspoken critic of the former president. His latest book, American Happiness and Discontents, The Unruly Torrent, 2008 to 2020, is a collection of his columns from the last decade, uh, actually more than a decade, and provides a window into how the country that elected Barack Obama became the country that put Donald Trump into power. George Will, great to see you again. Thanks for coming on the show. Glad to be with you. All right, so what do you make of this? Do you think that these recent comments by Donald Trump about suggesting that Republicans not vote in 2022 or 2024 until the supposed fraud in 2020 is resolved is going to lead, push, some Republicans to say at some point enough is enough? Well, as usual, uh, for Mr. Trump, politics is all about Mr. Trump, not the, not the health of the party. One of the reasons Democrats did fairly well in 2018 in the off-year elections was that a lot of Trumpers, when Mr. Trump was not at the top of the ticket, lost interest. And they did stay home without being urged to stay home. Whether they'll do that this time, I don't know, because 
the Republicans are getting an enormous assist from the Democratic Congress right now, which is <laughs> and people are reasonably frightened because they see the Kabul airport writ large in the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and then heating prices spiking as, as an extra cold winter is predicted. It, it's just a general sort of Carter-esque 1970s unraveling that people have. That, will, if anything, will take people's uh, obsessive gaze off the 45th president. It's the behavior of the 46th president. But and that would suggest that you know if there was a head-to-head -head race between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, that would be the sort of analysis that would certainly be employed. But in terms of figuring out if Donald Trump is going to be the candidate uh, for the Republican, it is clear to me he's going to run. Uh, I think anyone who suggests that, oh, I think he's going to bow out at the last minute, I don't think that's going to happen. I guess the question I have is if he keeps obsessing over the 2020 election and continues to threaten, in effect, the party, that unless they do something, I don't know what he expects them to do, but to do something about it, that he's going to start encouraging people not to vote. I mean, at, at what point do they have to cut bait? So, uh, on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November of 2024, they have to cut bait. And, and I think Republicans are not going to be led around like that. Maybe 30 percent of the Republican Party would be influenced by that, but 70 percent wouldn't be. And I think the 30, as they approach the polling booths, would become serious in a way that that uh, the Trump exhortation in this regard is not quite serious. I think it's important to understand the Democrats have a problem, too. If Joe Biden does not run, Donald Trump then is looking at a party that will have to decide whether or not to elevate Kamala Harris, a woman of color, to be his successor. Now, Kamala Harris demonstrated in the, night, in the 2020 nomination scramble that she has minimal appeal to the American electorate. And she has, frankly, minimal appeal to people who've worked with her in Washington. So the Democrats would have a problem, and if they should nominate Kamala Harris to run against Donald Trump, it could be a, a deluge. Yep. And, and you had pronounced uh, publicly that you had voted for Biden um, over Trump. And yeah. so you just made a point that made me think, if you were forced to choose between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, who would you vote for? <laughs> <laughs> What a hideous thought. Uh, I, I, I think in a case like that, you might get, and you've seen recently from Jonah Goldberg and some others talk about a third party. It's well to remember the Republican Party was a third party as the Whigs were beginning to, to disintegrate. Now, the, Repu the Whigs got weaker and weaker and disintegrated. The Republican Party is not disintegrating because it is still largely rallying around the personality of the, of the previous president. But uh, if you had a choice that austerely awful, it seems to me that uh, there certainly would be a third choice, and I'd probably <laughs> vote for that. But, yeah. Right. Know, that, That's um, it. I love the fact that, that George Will, on a sort of impossible-like question, can still figure out a way to incorporate history uh, into it, to, to sort of dodge the question. Shows you why he's been doing this so long, um, to be able to... Uh, to make historical references when not answering the impossible question for you. Let me ask you this. If you can stick around for a minute, I want to take a quick break here. I've got a lot more questions about the future of the Republican Party. I want to ask you about 2022. Um, George Will coming back with us in a moment. We're back talking to George Will, his latest book, American Happiness and Discontents, The Unruly Torrent 2008 to 2020 is a collection of his columns from the last decade plus. Um, good to have you back. Let me ask you about the Virginia election, um, something I'm certain that you've been keeping an eye on there. And again, I wonder what the role of Donald Trump means to the election in the sense that he has come out to endorse Youngkin, the Republican. Youngkin has been walking a very, very fine line. Um, we now have seen a number of people at a, at a Youngkin event pledging allegiance to a flag that had been carried on January the 6th. Um, one has to wonder whether the last thing Youngkin wants is any involvement from Donald Trump. 
Yes, well, former Governor uh, Terry McAuliffe, who's uh, Youngkin's opponent, has one theme, and that is, I don't like Donald Trump. Republic Democrats ran for about 40 years against Herbert Hoover until they wore that one out. And it may take them at least that long to wear out the, <laughs> the, the use of Donald Trump as a bogeyman. You notice that uh, McAuliffe uh, asked uh, Barack Obama, Mr. Uh, uh, Trump's predecessor to come in and campaign for him. And I'd be very surprised if Youngkin's going to ask Mr. Trump to come in and campaign for him. It's a tremendously interesting race because an issue has actually intruded upon the proceedings, and it is the issue of parental control of public education. In a debate, uh, Terry McAuliffe rather inadvertently blurted out his absolute fidelity to the teachers' unions by saying he didn't think teachers ought to, parents ought to be telling teachers what goes on in their schools. And it's right. that's been a wonderful lot tagline in some ads against Terry McAuliffe. And uh, it, it's, it's as, as I say, it's given a genuine issue with national resonance uh, to this, this state. If McAuliffe loses, and it's much too close for comfort for the Democrats, that will be what did it. And this will be a shot across the Democrats' bow and all their woke uh, uh, doctrines. And they say, this could be, critical race theory and all the rest, could be the equivalent of what we saw in uh, 2020, defund the police. That, that yep. three-word phrase almost reelected Donald Trump and almost cost the Democrats their House majority. Uh, and a lot more people are angry about uh, what's going on in in the form of indoctrination instead of education in our public schools, then we're angry about the the nonsense, which is what it was, uh, about defunding the police. Showing once again that uh, all these elections in the end uh, are local um, and uh, people are thinking about their schools and their kids uh, more than they are about uh, Donald Trump. We'll see uh, once the, the results. Let me ask you, you know, uh, do you think that what has happened to the Republican Party is permanent? Meaning, when Donald Trump is gone, is Trumpism still going to dominate the Republican Party, in your view? I don't think so. You know, George Wallace was a big force in the country for a while, and when he got shot and, and, and left the scene, Wallaceism disappeared. Ross Perot got almost 20% of the popular vote in 1992, one in five votes. When Perot left the stage, Perotism left the stage. What happens is our parties are marvelously responsive market mechanisms. They tremor like, like seismographs, to change the metaphor, to every quake in the political landscape. And I think aspects of what Trump appealed to, that is a kind of populist itch on the part of people who feel left behind by globalization and all the rest, that will find voices from people who are not as, shall we say, exhausting as Donald Trump proved to be. Uh, you're gonna find Republicans who, who find a way to have a, a, a more toned down, more intellectually respectable, less aesthetically appalling approach to these issues than, than Mr. Trump had. You know, one of the things on a final note, not related to politics that I learned from one of your books or was reminded of it, was when you pointed out that historically how difficult life was for people 100 years ago, uh, for example, how much more we have today, just in terms of everyday things, ability to function than people did 100 years ago. And I think it's a, just a great, nice reminder that we should appreciate a little bit what we have. You want to give a final thought on that before you run? We suffer from cultural hypochondria in the United States. And the thought experiment is this. In 1916, uh, John D. Rockefeller became America's first billionaire. That's a billion dollars, 1916 dollars, which is serious money. Make someone this offer. I'll, I'll make you as rich as Rockefeller was in 1916, but you got to live in 1916. No antibiotics, no Netflix, no modern transportation. You take them up on that, I don't think anyone in their right mind would go back and live in 1916, even as a... I don't know. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> um, George Will, 
thank you for coming on the program. Appreciate it. So good thank to have you. you. Thank you. Still to come tonight, caught on police body cam, officers serving an arrest warrant when a man opens fire, tragically killing one of the officers and injuring another. Coming up. Time for our police cam segment, showing you the dangers officers face every day around the country. Tonight, we're seeing what happened with police in Houston when they went to arrest a suspect. Dion Leadit, wanted on a drug warrant. Houston police released body cam video from six officers. We have edited those together to provide you with multiple angles, but we want to warn you, the video may be difficult to watch. Dion, it's Houston police. Let's do this thing. Houston police. Let's do this thing. Within moments of officer arriving on the scene, Ledet opened fire with an illegally modified handgun while children were in the home and his girlfriend was standing next to the police. Senior officer William Jeffrey was shot and killed in line of duty that day. Second officer, Sergeant Charles Vance, was shot in the leg. It was later, he was later treated and released from the hospital a few days after the incident. Ledet was ultimately shot and killed at the scene, the Houston ATF says. The suspect's handgun was fitted with a device that turned it into an automatic weapon. Attorney Shaka Johnson, uh, who also served in uniform as a Fulton County, Georgia detective, is with us. Thanks very much uh, for taking the time. Appreciate it. I think Thank that you, that is a, a difficult video uh, to watch for yes. anyone. Um, tra tragic situation where an officer was killed, another was injured. Um, what's your first reaction when looking at this uh, just released body cam. And this is this is exceedingly difficult uh, to watch. A lot of times you will you get the warning, you know, be mindful, you know, the contents of this video are difficult to watch and I'm sort of numb to it. This had a different effect on me. Um, I was not expecting to see and or hear what I what I experienced. The first thing that I noticed was uh, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm waiting for something to happen. And the first thing that I noticed was the amount of rounds, the amount of shots that went off uh, when Ms. Mr. Ledet uh, opened fire. It, it was so rapid, I had to stop the video, rewind it. And I thought to myself, is this, this is before I understood that it was a case involving an illegal switch. I said, could he possibly be pulling the trigger that fast? It was three or four or five shots and a burst immediately uh, that befell Officer Murphy. So... Um, it was very difficult to watch. You know, it, it doesn't matter. I don't think what side of the aisle you are on, whether you are prosecuting uh, defendants or defending defendants, uh, to see police officers who are operating, to be truthful, with some measure of temper. You know, they were they were trying to uh, get him out in, in, in really the uh, the most cautious way possible. You know, talking about the property, et cetera, and then to just watch that was really difficult. Well, I, I want to actually replay that because you, you bring up a, a very important point about how quickly the bullets were fired from the suspect's weapon. Let's, let's listen to that again. Dion, it's Houston police. Let's do this thing. <laughs> yeah, because when, when I heard that, I thought the same thing about how did he get yeah. off all those rounds uh, so quickly, the ATF right. special agent said illegal toggle switches that can turn handguns yes. into automatic weapons fire yes. 30 rounds in less than three seconds. I mean, it is uh, something that is obviously plaguing uh, some of the areas that already have mm -hmm. epidemics of gun violence going on. Um, you know, my research, Dan, shows that Chicago, which already is, you know, has its you know, complexities with gun violence. These switches are turning up all over Chicago. Uh, they're turning up in some of the other places around the country that already have ongoing gun and firearms and gun violence related issues. Uh, so here, here in Houston, officers are serving a warrant for relatively, relatively 
benign offenses, narcotics. Right. Um, there, there is an inherent amount of uh, skepticism in terms of perceived violence that comes along with when you're executing that kind of warrant. But the person wasn't warranted for an act of violence. And to be met with uh, a person with a hand that it sounded, I thought it was uh, maybe an AR-15 or some sort of long gun that is yeah. used to dispatch that level of uh, firepower in a short amount of time. To learn that you can easily switch a handgun to essentially an assault rifle <clears throat> with just a clicking of a switch mm. is uh, it's problematic for our community. It really is. Now, this is obviously you know, emotional to watch this. We know that an officer died. We heard officers trying to save the officer who was killed. They can't even get to him uh, right. right away. That has got to be so frustrating for the other officers there. And I'm sure in retrospect, they live with that every day. I, I when I watched this video, I went back and I'm gonna be very honest with you. You know, sometimes we all, we all like to Monday morning quarterback. What could have been done differently here from a tactical approach? I was a SWAT team officer as well. So I am watching this initially just to get the story, uh, uh, you know, a, a good, my, wrap my head around the story. Then of course, I'm watching it from a tactical approach once I realized officers have been hit. The reality of it is the way in which uh, they cut firepower was being laid down upon them. There was no way to get to Officer Murphy. It's really just it yep. wasn't. And uh, he was seemingly, um, you know, put out of commission relatively quickly. You know, uh, you could tell he fell on his back, couldn't gather himself. And the other officers did exactly what is called for. You, you can't put yourself in harm's way. You take cover, you know, you know, return fire and then do what you can. It was a really bad situation, but that man, Mr. Ledet, it might as well have been five or six people shooting at those police officers, because when you have a yeah. fully automatic weapon and the rounds to go with it, well, the odds are even. Yeah, a lot of the segments that we've been doing on this uh, have involved officers who've obviously survived, et cetera. Um, and obviously one of the officers did here, but when you see uh, this and you know the outcome, it is just incredibly disturbing. Attorney and former detective Shaka Johnson, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know this was, uh, this was a tough one. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, it was a, it was a little difficult. It really was. And those officers uh, who were there, the other officers whose body-worn cameras we did get the opportunity to view, you know, they are going to be, uh, they won't be the same after this. You know, I, I Absolutely. Absolutely true. And absolutely. I think that's a very, very important point to remind people about about the psychological um, trauma that those other officers are now going to have to endure. Shaka, thank you Absolutely. very much. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you. Coming up, have you seen 17-year-old Genesis? Her family is desperate to find her. They think she was lured away by an older guy. How you can help bring her home, coming up next. Welcome back. Every Friday here on the show, we're going to ask for your help to find a missing child. This week, we focus on Genesis Ramos, a 17-year-old from River Grove, Illinois. Genesis has been missing since leaving her home in the early hours of March 24th, 2021. This video of her leaving her parents' home that night, this is uh, the last time that they saw her. Family members believe she was lured out by an older guy. U.S. Marshals are working with the River Grove Police Department to bring Genesis home safely. Her family says she's in critical need of daily medication as well. Joining me now is Angeline Hartman. She's the media director for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Angeline, as always, thank you for coming back on the show. Appreciate it. So what can you tell us about Genesis' disappearance? I'm look, looking at that video of her leaving. She's blowing a kiss to her family. It doesn't seem yeah. like there was some major argument that led her to leave the home. What can you tell us? Yeah, that's exactly right, Dan. I talked to her mom, and mom says, Everything was fine that night. They had dinner. They were the family was together at around 11 o'clock that night. Genesis, you know, goes to her room to go to sleep. It's a school night. The next morning, 6 a.m., mom goes to Genesis uh, to her room to wake her up, and she's gone. She left behind her cell phone, her laptop, you know, all of her favorite things, her money. Uh, mom doesn't know. You can see in that video she's wearing a backpack, and mom doesn't even know where that backpack came from. It's not familiar to her. If you look a little bit closely, uh, you can hear her say, I love you to the camera. And you can kind of, she right. blows a kiss to the camera. 
So mom says this is a very close knit family and Genesis has never run away before. You know, she's, this is totally out of character for her. Um, and so one, everybody's very upset. One, one of the biggest things that, that you can have, one of the most promising things you can have in a case like this is a sighting. And I understand there has been a sighting of her since she disappeared. What do you know about that? Well, uh, investigators tell me that there was a confirmed sighting of Genesis in a little town about, let's say, 10 miles away, not long after she disappeared. They can't tell us too many details about that. But fast forward to June, a tip was called in that she was possibly sighted at a house. Uh, and so police say that that is very possible that she was there. They're, they're going with that. Um, and, but since then, they, they, they don't know. Um, they do believe she's still in the Chicago area. And um, you know, investigators have a few names. They've questioned different people in this case. And so far, nothing. But again, they do believe she's still in this area. It is just very difficult to watch that video. Mom wants to point out that Genesis is, uh, is on the autism spectrum. And she is a little bit gullible when it comes to meeting new people, right? And she doesn't know social boundaries very well. And they've kept her very isolated. And so that plays a role into what's happening here, her meeting people, her being possibly lured away by somebody older. Yeah, I don't it's want to not ask a, you about it's not that. A good, it's not a good well, scenario. But what, what do we know? I mean, you know, as we said, she was lured away, they think, by an older guy. What do we, what do we know right. about that? Right. So apparently she met somebody last year, right? They know who this person is. He's older. He's about 19 or 20. And uh, what they know of this person is not good, does not have a you know, very aggressive type of personality is, is what I'm told. And so Genesis was told, listen, this is not a good scenario for you. This is not, you know, again, she doesn't really understand social boundaries and doesn't understand a lot of things. So they explained that to her and she stopped seeing him apparently. That's what they thought. Now that she's disappeared, they've gone into her things, they've done their research, and it looks like she did not stop seeing him. And she, he may be the person who lured away. He's one of the people that investigators have talked to. She's not with him now. So was she with him at one point? Did he lure her away? Was it somebody totally different? Investigators don't know. But it is very clear to the family that someone lured her away. Yeah, and they have not heard from her. That is the, the most important point here from a close-knit family that they have not heard from her at all. Um, yeah, and the medication is, is a very important thing. They are very worried about her because she needs daily medication, and, and that is unclear if she has that. Yeah. Um, all right, let's, um, let's put up the number, uh, if we can, that people can call. Um, if, you have any, where, if you have any information about the whereabouts of Genesis Ramos, got a link on our newsnationnow.com slash Dan Abrams Live. But you can also just contact authorities. 1-800-THE-LOST. That's 1-800-843-5678 is the number. Dan, can call. I just say one quick thing? Their Real family quick. is so grateful that you're doing this because this is not a story that has been in the news, right? This has had very little, if any at all, news coverage. And it's probably because... She, you can see that she left on her own. And so right. she falls right. into the category of a runaway situation. But there's always more to the story, yep. you know, behind the scenes. So we appreciate I th you. I think the I, yeah, and I think the context you provided here is, is very, very important. Angeline, as always, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Com coming back with some unbelievable media clips in a moment. Time now for our Mediaite Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. I'm not sure if there's something in the air or what, but for some reason, curse words have been all over the media of late, starting with Daniel Craig, who's been promoting his latest and last turn as James Bond. During an interview with Sirius XM's Bruce Bozzi, he explained his preference for gay bars. One of the reasons, because... I don't get into fights in gay <laughs> that often. <laughs> the aggressive 
swinging in right. hetero bars. I just got very sick of. He gets in that many bar fights, and it's the others who are swinging there. Okay. And then on Newsmax, a guest went to great lengths to defend some of the words used by former NFL Las Vegas Raiders coach John Gruden. Uh, you know what? What what happened to some some good old fashioned football humor and banter? Uh, I don't think that means he's a racist. You know what? Over in Europe, they 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 the word is actually for a cigarette. Mm, I think he's confusing a British cigarette, which is a shortened version of that word, with a bundle of sticks. Look it up. And the use of curse words isn't always embarrassing. Sometimes it can be comedic, as in this campaign ad for New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. Do you know who this guy is? No clue. No. Uh-uh. That's Jack Cittarelli, the GOP candidate for governor. He once led an effort to ban swearing. You're shitting me. <laughs> he did what? No f***ing way. One f***ful. What the f***? Aw, that's kind of nice. Really? No. This is f***ing New Jersey. We can't let that f***ful win. Swear words, I guess, can be funny. And sometimes media moments don't need to be cursing to be offensive, like this from Russian President Vladimir Putin. How can you expect Europe to believe you're a reliable energy partner when you're not supplying that energy via the pipeline? A beautiful woman, but I'm saying one thing to you and you are saying a different thing to me, as if you have not heard what I said. Putin dismissing a good, tough question from CNBC's Hadley Gamble with the you're too pretty to understand sexism. And to think, some have suggested the guy's actually charming in person. That is our wrap of the day's media bias, buzz, and the bull, our mediaite moments. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. News Nation Prime starts 